Hello, and welcome to At Home with Penguin. I'm Marion Keyes, I'm um, a Penguin author, and this is a live weekly event where every Tuesday a writer will invite you into their home and tell you what's been going on for them, how they're managing their routine, and some of the things that are giving them comfort. And if you would like, I am here to answer your questions for the next uh, 30 minutes or so. So um, type your uh, question into the comment section and I will do my very best to give you um, a detailed answer. And while we're waiting for the questions to come through, I want to tell you about a couple of the books I'm reading at the moment. The first one is a book that I've already read. I'm going to show it to you. It's, um, it's called Gravity is the Thing. It's by Australian writer Jacqueline Moriarty. And I feel in a way this might be my most favorite book of all time. It just, it's both magical, it's very whimsical and also incredibly grounded. And it's about a woman who is learning to fly, but not in a plane, like literally herself learning to fly. And, but apart from that, it's actually an incredibly, you know, a really honest and truthful book about relationships and love. And it's really, really lovely. Then another thing that I have decided I'm going to during this special and strange time is The Shell Seekers by Rosamond Pilcher. And um, this is one of those books that everybody in the whole world seems to have read except for me. And if you ever mention it, people go, oh, I loved that book. And I want to be one of the people who say, oh, I loved that book because I hate being left out of things. So this is what I'm going to read this evening. And I'm just finding like with books at the moment, they are so, they're like vitamin B. For the nerves like i'm in a state of kind of constant low level dread but when i read a book and i'm sort of caught up in it then um then i'm able to forget about things for a while and then i'm not so working with my mother and uh, that sort of thing and the rest of the time like i've been just trying to stick to a routine like you know i do get up and go to my computer in the morning to try and write and i switch it on and then i sit there and for about I don't know, 45 to 80 minutes, I stare into space and think about what I'm going to eat next. Um, most of my uh, isolation time has been about food and eating and uh, when I can have more sweets and what if we run, run out of Percy Pigs. And, you know, though, um, I suppose, yeah, it's better than uh, the rest of the stuff. And, um, here in Ireland at the moment, we're only allowed uh, go two kilometers from our home and um, everybody is kind of trying to to get the most out of their two kilometers and I'm lucky in that I live near um, Dunleary Pier and that is included in my two kilometers but himself my husband who's a great man for the long runs he runs the circumference of the two kilometers which I think works out at about 16 kilometers um, and then you hear about these kind of daring types who who break go like 2.2 kilometers and uh, I wonder if they're going to be arrested because Nigardia, that's the Irish police, are out uh, stopping cars. Um, but yeah, it's a funny, funny old time and uh, it's difficult for everyone. And I think it's really important that we all go as easy on ourselves as we can. You know, I hear people saying about, you know, learning a new language during this time as if, <clears throat> as if this is like, you know, a holiday. Like, it's absolutely not. You know, we have to remember that, like, there's a global pandemic going on. It's very scary. None of us have lived through something like this before. So we can't expect ourselves to be functioning as normal. We're scared. And m most of our energy is going into sort of fight or flight, like all hyper vigilant at the moment. And when you're hyper vigilant, there isn't much room in your head for learning, learning Korean. For example, so if you're struggling with the Korean alphabet, don't be too hard on yourself. Tell yourself, that's me fight or flight um, interfering with my Korean alphabet. Um, so at this stage, will we take a look and see if any of you have sent any questions? Hold on, I put my books away. Right, I'm back. So we have a question from, hello, Marion. How is your new book coming along? And that is from... Laura Foster, I think I'm really sorry. I've got my contact lens in, so I can't really read. I can see far away, like myself in the camera, but I can't really read. Okay, my new book, right? It is coming along very slowly because that's the way things are at the moment. Um, it's hopefully a Walsh book. Now the thing is, uh, 
many of you who've read any of my other books will know that like I don't believe in sequels. I just have never been able to write them because I feel like my characters go through enough in each book and <clears throat> by the end, like they're done. And you see, if you're writing a sequel, you have to go in and you have to break things and mess things up because there can be no book about happy times because if everything is happy, who cares? Like nobody wants to know. Like it's all right for a while, but you need some sort of sorrow or, or drama of some sort. So I actually tried to write another Walsh book. The break was meant to be about Claire from Watermelon. And I just, it made me too sad to do it. And I thought that that would kind of be the end of my attempts at, um, at a, a sequel. But anyway, after I finished writing Grown Ups, I just got this idea. And I wondered how Rachel from Rachel's Holiday is getting on. And the idea didn't go away. And I found myself thinking more and more about her. And my worry is that like Rachel's Holiday is a book that has meant a lot to a lot of people because it's helped a lot of addicts to get clean and, and it's helped children of addicts or alcoholics to understand how it was for their parents. Like it's a book that has helped a lot of people. And the last thing I want to do is, is ruin it because I don't know if you've ever lo loved a book and then you've read the sequel and the sequel has been so crappy that you thought, A, I hate the sequel and B, I'm not so sure that the original was that good either. It sort of ruins everything. So I'm proceeding with great caution, but it is a book about Rachel. Um, that's all I can tell you. I'm not very far in, um, but there was a man who was in Rachel's Holiday that Rachel was very pally with, if you get me. That man is also in this book. Um, that's all I'll say. Um, if I think it's going to be rubbish, I will junk it. But I'm trying my best and I'm really hopeful that um, that it might work out. Sure, look, we'll give it a shot anyway. And uh, and hopefully I won't let you down. And thank you, Laura. That was a lovely question. Now, here's another uh, question I have to lean. OK, hold on. It's gone all blurry. What's the print behind you? Looks gorge. Can we see it all? Okay, it's a painting by an Irish painter. Actually, no, she's British. Her name's Lucy Doyle, but she lives in Wicklow, so she feels Irish to me. I'm going to lift my laptop and we'll see if you can see it all. Um, bear with me now. It's very... Um, oh. Is that any good, Jim? Let me get out of the way. Hold on. Yeah. Sorry, I dropped my microphone. How's that? Can you see me? Yeah, I'm sorry I couldn't show you more. I'm in a fairly narrow space here. We tried to pick a spot in the house that has the best Wi-Fi so that it doesn't drop out. So I'm actually sitting on the landing um, and I would have tumbled over the banister if I had gone any further. Um, I'll post a picture of it on Instagram later of the full painting. Okay, right now. All right, so another question now. And listen, I'll answer Anthony. It doesn't have to be about uh, writing or Anthony. Now, hi, Marion. Are you something your supplies Am I keeping my supplies of Percy pigs up? Oh, okay, I'll tell you how it is. Um, the Percy pigs are hidden in a secure bunker somewhere in the house. I do not have access to the code because if I did, I would break in and I would eat them all and then they would be gone. Himself is in charge of the bunker. He has, you know, it's hand, hand print recognition, the heat and all of that. It's really, really complex. Um, so I sometimes say to him, please, can I have four Percy pigs? And he'll give me the four. And sometimes I can be more specific and I can say, please, can I have four of the Easter Percy pigs? And I don't know if you know about the, the Easter ones. There are yellow bunnies in them. I think they're like, um, they're pineapple flavored. They are so great. Um, so I actually don't know how many we have, but I feel secure in that, like, I've never felt anxiety from him. You know, I, I, when I've asked for something, he hasn't gone, oh, Jesus, we're down to our last eight or anything like that. I'd say there are sacks and sacks of them in the bunker. And um, 
the, the Saxon Sax will get me to Friday. You know, it's good. And then Friday will come and he'll go to Marks and Spencer's again. Yeah, I, I feel fairly confident about this. God, I love talking about sweets. I, ask me more things about sweets and biscuits, please. No, you don't have to. That was lovely. Thanks. Now, Mary, can you share where your earrings are from? Can we have a closer look at them? I will try and give you a closer look if I can figure out this camera. Right. These earrings are from Cult Gaia. Um, C-U-L-T-G-A-I-A. -A. Um, and they have them in different colors and different sizes. And um, these are the small ones because I have an embarrassingly small head and uh, I need to keep things in proportion. Um, I bought them last year, you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe last summer. Um, but I'd say you could find them if I actually bought them off of Net-A-Porte, um, but I'd say they have more on the actual Cult Gaia site. But thank you very much. I wore them specially. Now, have we another question? Yeah. Where in your house do you tend to write? OK, I um, I will kind of show you. I'm going to twist the laptop around. Um, see that door there? That's the spare bedroom. I write in there. I'll see if I can open it for you. In there. I can't show you much more of it because I don't want to, we don't want to run the risk of the microphone falling off again. Um, yeah, the spare bedroom, which is lovely because many of you who know me will know that I, I would never get dressed um, unless I really, really had to. And it means that I can get up and walk four feet down the landing and go to the spare bedroom and, uh, and start writing. You know, people have offices in there. She wanted to feel officey. I don't want it to feel daunting. Um, so it's literally, it's a little desk and a, a little uh, computer um, in the corner. And But the rest of the room is a bedroom, like it's a, it's a bed and a wardrobe and uh, a lamp and, you know, bedroomy sort of things. That, that's where I do it. Now, have we another? What's the most something response you've had to COVID-19? What's the most? I can't see it. Irish, is it? Irish response? Yeah, I don't really know what you mean by that. Um, I mean, do you mean like people sneaking into pubs and stuff like that? I think they're doing that everywhere, though. Um, by and large, in fairness, I think Irish people have been incredibly well behaved. You know, I think as a nation, we are kind of natural lawbreakers. You know, for me, like a red light is merely a suggestion. Um, I joke, of course I joke, I'm joking, but you know what I mean? Like, uh, it's all kind of casual, but I think we're all terrified. Um, I am anyway, and everyone I know. So I think we've been really well behaved. Um, you know, I mean, like, it actually has pained me. Like, I went over to um, the chemist the other day, and people were queuing outside the Tesco's over at Honey Park, and like they were standing like the, the six feet from each other, walking. And I actually experienced that almost like as a visceral pain. Like to see Irish people not talking was just really—it was very eerie. Uh, that's not what we do. Um, Mostly, though, I think we're very we're, we've been we've been good through this, really, really good. And uh, in one way, you know, I feel we have not lived up to our reputation as natural lawbreakers. But on the other hand, I'm really, really glad that we're actually doing what we're told for once. Thank you. Now, what was the most what was your something book to write? And what was my most difficult? OK. Easiest book was definitely the first one was Watermelon because I hadn't a clue. I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't know that there were any such things as rules and chapters and grammar and spelling and and plot. You know, anything that occurred to me, I just threw it in. I thought, this is entertaining. I like writing this. I'm going to put it in. And, you know, it just it was so easy to write like and I had I don't remember one doubt when I was writing that book. I mean, it was at a time of my life as well when I was, you know, out of rehab not that long, like literally four, five months, six months. And I was just so full of kind of hope and joy about everything. Um, I, it was just blissful. Then when I was trying to write my second book, I'd learned a bit about all the things I had done wrong in the first book. And 
once you know, like all the voices were in my head then go, no, don't do that, and you can't do that, and fix that, and no. Now, what has been the hardest? I don't know, this charming man was, was a real uh, challenge because it was like three or four different books in one. And like knitting the whole second thing together was a real sort of feat of architecture. Like that was, that was hard. Um, you know, it, I mean, it depends really on the book. I mean, like the last one, Grown Ups, like, again, that's a very kind of a complicated one in that there's seven main characters in it. But it didn't, didn't wreck my head in the same way. I think it's, it's not just the book that makes it difficult to write. It's where a person is at that time in their life and just how, how relaxed they're feeling, how courageous or confident. So yeah, I suppose this charming man was probably the most daunting. I'll, I'll tell you something though, I'm, I'm a nervous wreck writing the new one, but that could be just down to, you know, the current unpleasantness. It mightn't be the book at all. Um, thank you. Thanks a million. Right, so give us another question. Did you always want to be a writer from when you were a kid? No, not at all. Like when I was a kid, um, all I wanted was to be happy. Um, but I had no idea how people went about that. And you know the way like girls in your class at school, they'd say like they wanted to be an air hostess. That was big. That was big in my day. Like that was kind of the height of glamour. In, um, you know, early 70s Ireland, air hostess, like you just couldn't get more kind of more glitzy and aspirational. Um, or, you know, they'd want to be a teacher. Yeah, there's lots of people who want to be teachers um, or, or a nun. Even some people would give that, but then they'd be only trying to suck up to the teacher. So they probably didn't really want to be a nun. Um, and I had no ability to kind of conceive of um, a future for me. Like it was blank, like it was absolutely blank. And like it remained blank, like all the way through my teens. Um, and I went to university and I studied law because I got the, um, you know, the grades to do it. But like, I had no interest in it whatsoever. I was just really grateful to be allowed to go to university and to put off like real life for another three years. And even then, like, I had no idea that I wanted to write because the family I came from, we just didn't do that sort of thing. Like, you know, my dad was so fixated on sort of permanent and pensionable. Like that was his mantra, permanent and pensionable. You know, like you'd ask him anything and he would just, he would wake up in the middle of the night, he'd sit bolt upright in the bed and he'd go, permanent and pensionable. Like that was all he wanted. Like he wanted security for his children. And are like writers and intellectuals seemed like, you know, poshos and entitled people who came from a long line of articulate, confident people who ran the country. And, you know, my mother came from like a three roomed cottage in County Clare, like a tiny small holding with six cows. And my dad came from inner city Limerick poverty, like and neither of them had any sense that that sort of writing world could be for us. So I loved reading and I loved kind of, I loved being around funny people because like my mother is still like that and, and my sisters and kind of the house seemed to be always full of people, gas people, you know, like my mother likes funny people and she sort of would kind of accumulate hilarious people. So I learned the importance of like telling a story and making people laugh. But that was just what you did in your spare time. Like that wasn't the sort of thing that you made money from. And it was only when my life, it, and I had just turned 30, that I had started to write. And my life started to shut down because I was in the last kind of horrific crash and burn of active alcoholism. And uh, and I felt like, like there wasn't really anything left to keep me alive. And it was, I do think is, you know, that there's something in every human being, there's this kind of urge to stay alive, even when we don't want to. And something in me decided I'm going to start writing short stories and it was very sudden it was like the thing an alien that erupts and I do think it was it was this kind of tussle inside me to keep me alive even though I didn't want to and it was like okay I think you can write stories 
if I if I open this for you and give it to you, will you stay? And so that was how it was for me. So I didn't start until I was 30 and I had no idea that I wanted to do it until I was 30. And so, you know, there's I often say this, there's no wrong way to be a writer and there's no right time to start. Start anytime. Start now. Do it today. You know, any time is fine so long as you do it. Thank you. That was a lovely um, question. Now, can you please do a Lipstick World Cup like the foundation? Yes, I can. Wait till I tell you. Um, the foundation one was great because I had eight foundations. I actually had nine. I am ashamed. Of course I'm ashamed. But like, I can do nothing by halves. Any of you who know me will know that. Like, I, I have no dimmer switch. I am on or I am off. If I like something, I love it with all my heart. So yes, I am... I am all about the foundations. And somebody was saying, could we do a mascara one? But we can't because I only have one mascara. We cannot do a World Cup with one mascara. However, lipsticks, Jesus Christ, that's a fabulous idea. Because like, it's not just lipsticks. I mean, I have lip glosses. I have liquid matte. I have like balms. Um, I have things in a pot. That is an amazing idea. Um, now, the thing is, the foundation was handy because I have you know, a big face. Well, actually, small by normal faces, but I was able to do two sides. I don't know if I'd be able to do two sides on the lip. Well, I'll figure it out. But um, yes, that's a fantastic idea. I'll start accumulating them this evening. Um, lovely idea. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now, hi, Marion. Are you doing any baking doing these strangest of days? I actually am not right now, but I'll tell you, the longing is on me um after right i used baking and it was like all of 2010 and half of 2011 when i was really not well and it helped me so much um it was such a a godsend um but afterwards i stopped kind of as abruptly as i started and after i got well again i oh, associated baking with feeling kind of incredibly depressed and very kind of unwell in the head and anything bakingry you know kind of brought the feelings back a little bit and like you know i used to get ptsd like if i looked at a sieve um or anything like that and i gave away so much of my stuff and um and then himself put the rest of the good tins up in the attic because they were just taking up room in the kitchen but since this all started the long and has come upon me again. And so he's got the yolks back down from the, the attic. And I, um, I've i ordered things like, you know, food, uh, the, the coloring, you know, the lovely dye for the um, the icing and glittery stuff, edible glitter, that sort of a thing. Um, and I do actually have, then I couldn't get flour. Yeah, there was like such a run on flour, like in all the Tesco's and everything that like, there, there was none. And then I managed to hijack old woman's super value delivery. Um, and I sneaked some flour onto that and she managed to get some. So I have all the stuff at the moment and I'm trying to put it off. Like I'm trying to kind of um, use different things like reading because when I was baking before, I was uh, able to kind of offload my excess produce onto my neighbors. Um, until they all got type two, type two diabetes, and and then they, they weren't my friend anymore. But at the moment, if if I bake things, I can't give it to them because I could I could infect them. Um, so I'd have to eat it myself, and and you know I constantly tussle with my self hatred around my size and my relationship with food, and I feel like if I can kind of stave off the bacon for as long as possible and use other things like reading or telly watching um, or even painting, you know, I mean, that's great about the painting. Like I can't eat them um, when I finish them and that that's always good. Um, so I haven't yet, but it's not out of the question. Ah, uh, And I hope if you're baking that you're enjoying it. Yeah, everyone's making bread. Everyone's got their sourdough starter. Um, yeah, but then I'd eat all the bread as well. And, and that would be not good either. Uh, thanks. How are we? So what are your self-care top tips for this period of time when we are isolating ourselves? Um, okay. I mean, it's very much dependent on the person. 
but I would say don't watch the news. I mean, really stay away from social media um, because if you can, like only follow people who make you laugh and who don't talk about the state of the world because it's really not healthy for us to be overloading ourselves with hits of fear. You know, it, it physically affects us. Like, you know, when we're scared, things like adrenaline and cortisol are like firing off in our bodies and making us feel terrible and interfering with our sleep and just, you know, making us feel wretched. If you can get some exercise, um, please do. Um, you know, and obviously I'm not saying this to people who are actually, you know, literally suffering from the illness of depression at the moment because you won't be able to but for all of you know for the rest for those of us who are well and who want to stay that way you know if you can get out in the air like if you can walk or if you can do yoga you know like nothing too brutal you know because this is a time to be kind and gentle like a routine is so important like sticking to meal times is difficult for me because like like life for me would be just one long unbroken fabulous meal but to, like to have a breakfast a lunch and then i and myself have been making like a proper dinner in the evening um and that's kind of you know gives me something to look forward to and uh, and also it kind of gives me something to plan and i feel quite adult when i do it. it's like look at us here like weighing our such and such and you know sorting our other thing and and that feels nice. Um, uh, I, um, I'm, I'm an alcoholic in recovery, so I get to my meetings via Zoom. Like that's a huge help to me. But using something like Zoom or house party is a lovely way to stay in contact with people. Like seeing people's faces, I, the rush of joy that, that gives me, it's much, much bigger than just hearing them. On the other hand, though, if you're going through a spell and you just find I am exhausted, I'm too tired to talk to people, then observe that. You know, we can't be expecting ourselves to behave as normal. Like, I don't think any of us are really giving ourselves enough credit for the fact that we're enduring this because this is huge. Like, this is enormous. And it's the unknown, I think, that people find so frightening. The unknown and the possibility um, and that desire to protect the people we love, like that has done things to us that has, that, you know, we've never experienced this kind of, this kind of invasion into our psyche before. So go easy. Um, oh, especially stay away from social media and, and screens at night because like it's hard enough to sleep. Um, and even things like I mean, I am a failed meditator. Like I have just never, ever, ever, ever been able to get into that thing of meditation, you know, because I think I'm in it and then I go, oh God, look, I'm meditating. This is fantastic. And I think, no, but if I know I'm meditating, then I'm obviously not med meditating. But if you can meditate, do it. Um, read, watch telly, escape. You know, human beings can't take too much reality at the best of times and especially not at the moment. Like, do things that are completely disconnected from from the out there and um and just keep reminding yourself that you're doing great like and that this is much much harder than anyone is is really telling us and also i suppose it's really important for us to be grateful for our frontline workers you know to kind of to you know be so grateful that you might not have to do it but that other people are doing it i think to kind of shift our our position from ourselves to those who have it so much harder can sometimes be a huge help. Um, but yeah, uh, go easy on yourself would be my kind of overriding message. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. What other author's book do you wish you had written? I mean, I'm sorry to be, what's the word? Repeating myself, but I'm going to put it up again. Gravity is the Thing by Leanne Moriarty. I can't, like, I read it and I was just overwhelmed with the happy, the lovely feelings. But mixed in with that was the awful sorrow 
that I hadn't written it and that I would never write anything as good at it as it and that I might as well just set all my books on fire and just give it all up and go back to college and train as a nail technician, which is something I have wanted to do for many years. Um, oh, but there's so many books, like anything that Kate Atkinson has ever written. Um, like I'd, uh, I'd, um, I'd have wished to have written, especially behind the scenes at the museum. Um, I'm going to show you another book. Do you know The Diaries of the Provincial Lady by E.M. Delafield? Um, there are several ones. This is Provincial Lady in London. Um, they're so funny and gas and I mean it's it's written like you know like a diary like Bridget Jones diary but it was written in the 1930s and it's still she's you know she's every woman like the things she writes about you know even though it was in the 1930s and she's you know worried about her cook being really bad at her job and stuff like that and you think I don't have a cook but you can still, I, well, I can still identify. Um, I, I wish I'd written this as well. But yeah, I know a lot at the time. Like I read a lot of books and uh, and I passionately love them. Um, God, there must be millions. Yeah. Um, Eleanor Lippmann is another author I love. Um, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm blank now. Yeah, about once a week I read something and it sends me to decline and mm, Lucy Foley's books are great my dark Vanessa which is out at the moment um there's another another book that just um yeah but a lot I love a lot of writers which and you thank you which of your characters would you like to be quarantined with oh Jesus Right. Um, oh, my God. Uh, some of the quieter ones, I'd say. Um, some of the practical ones. Hmm. Mm -mm -mm. Amy out of the break. Um, she she's a very able type. Like she cook for me and um, and she's good at common sense and all of that. Now, Jessie from Grown Ups, definitely not like she'd be organizing me and we'd have to do day spas and we'd have to do group activities that would be dreadful um, um Ferdia from grown-ups but that would be for the wrong reasons forgive me I shouldn't have said that um and let me see Anna Walsh I, I've, I've had to reread um anybody out there recently because you know I've been catching up on the Walsh books for writing the new one and she's just very sweet and she would keep me in makeup which that seems to be kind of the one thing that I am horrifically fixated on through this awful time is is makeup like I'm doing my makeup every day like there's no one to see me but it's making me feel better let me see Anna Walsh uh, Lola Daly um out of this charming man is another one I'm very fond of um Mammy was definitely not. No, that would be awful. Um, it's hard enough with Mammy Keys trying to organize her um, her online shopping and getting the head bit off me for um, getting her the wrong tay bags. And, uh, and I've been trying to explain to her how substitution works, you know, like if they don't have the thing you asked for, they will give you another thing and that thing will not be right. So yeah, no Mammy Walsh. Do you know what I'm very happy with himself? Himself is no trouble. He's very easygoing. Um, I hope that answers it for you. Thank you. That's a lovely um, question. Um, do you ever feel imposter syndrome in your career? All the time. I mean, absolutely all the time. In fact, it, as you've asked me that, a couple of things have just popped into my head. Um, Leanne Moriarty, do you know her book, What I Just Forgot? That's another book. That like after I read it, I just wanted to lie on the floor and roll around and howl because it's so great. And um, you know, or Jojo Moyes, like me before you, like that is such a beautiful book. And I, I, I'd wish I wish I'd read it. I mean, yeah, I feel it a lot of the time when because it's a book is homemade. Do you know what I mean? Like it's not. Like when I was a kid and my mother would make a cake, it was always a bit mortifying because a homemade cake was like really crappy compared to like a shop bought cake. I know things are different now, but 
and like my mother used to make my clothes and it was all kind of oh jesus you know could we not buy them from the shop made by actual real shoe you know cake making or, or clothes making people and so i feel if i produce something that it's all a bit chunky and and rough and ready and and not polished um and then i mean there are those people in well in publishing i was going to say or you know or but in any industry who are just better at being confident you know who are much better at going i'm fabulous I am fabulous and and everyone should be lovely to me. Give me all the rewards now because I am fabulous. And when people act like that, people go, Jesus, he is fabulous. And the thing is, he is usually a he. They go, give, give him, come on, the lorry with the awards, quick, quick, back it up. Give it to the man, the fabulous man who has told us he's fabulous. And if you're not a natural fabulous person, you feel embarrassed saying, <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm a bit fabulous too. They go, oh, Jesus, you're not go away. Um, so yeah, I think, I think, as a woman, you're more likely to feel imposter syndrome anyway, because there'd be lots of people ready to tell you that you're not as good as the other people. Um, I think, I you know who knows. I think if you're Irish and you're my age, you were brought up and told you're very bold and you're terrible and you'll go straight to hell and you're no good and you know you internalize all that sort of stuff and so like i have so yeah i do i definitely do and i never feel it as badly as when i'm starting to try and write a new book because because it's all just coming from me and i would like somebody else to give me like a basic plot or something like that some kind of some plummy toned, double barreled named type Giles, somebody or other could come in and give it to me and I would pay him a lot of money. And then I think, well, at least I've got Giles's plot. You know, Giles's plot will see me through. So yes, yes, I do, I do. And I wish I didn't, but we are the way we are. Thank you, thanks. So will we, um, one, two, did you say? Two more, okay, okay. Do you write poetry as well? I don't write poetry and I will tell you why. Um, if you notice anything about me, I cannot be brief. Brevity is not my thing. I have that Irish thing of why use one word when 4,000 will do. I, I mean, and poetry is just like, it's it's like a mosaic of perfect gem words where like everything is there because it really deserves to be. Um, and I would, I mean, I can't write short stories either. I can't do anything short. I need huge amounts of space in order to to articulate whatever it is that I'm trying to say. So I don't. I'm sorry. Thank you. And we have a final question. Every time I see Magnum ice creams in the shops, I think of you. Which one is your favorite at the moment? Aren't you? lovely oh my god well since last summer actually the double raspberry one is absolutely lovely oh, i love it because you have the pink ice cream on the inside and i think if anything is colored pink it always tastes nicer even if it has no extra taste the pinkness just adds something lovely to it and then you have the chocolate the thin lovely thin chocolate and then you have the layer of kind of raspberry jam sort of a thing and you have another thin layer of um chocolate and uh, just that lovely crunchy feeling makes me feel sort of, you know, the sound makes me feel like I'm going to faint. Like I just love it so much. But I would take any of them really except the white one. The white one is just very insipid. And uh, over in Old Woman's freezer, nobody will eat the white one. So like there's this kind of stockpile. It's like a mass grave of mini white magnums, like that nobody will have. And like people are disgusted and they'll turn and walk away. Like they'd rather have none than the white one. They'd rather like abandon the ice creams altogether and go for a club milk or something like that. Um, so um, the raspberry one at the moment, also I was very partial to a coconut one. And I know the coconut one is not for everyone, but I love it. I also love bounties. Again, I know it may be not for everyone thank you so we leave it there and just to remind you that this is going to be going on every tuesday for uh, the next while and the next author will be and let me just check notes as they say is going to be
Lisa Helmsley. Um, so check Penguin social media to find out like the various people that will be coming over the next few weeks. And Melissa will be here, well, not here in my house, here in her house um, next Tuesday at five o'clock. Thank you so much to everyone who tuned in. Thank you for the questions. That's so nice of you. And um, and I hope, again, that you mind yourself and that you look after yourself. And if it all gets too much, just escape into a good book. Because when you're in the middle of a book, nobody can hurt you. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of you guys in Penguin Live for making it all happen. Thanks a million. Bye.